Dad's Army is one of Britain's most beloved sitcoms. The Germans are coming, don't panic, the Germans are coming! The iconic, energetically delivered catchphrases alone have become part of the national lexicon. Stupid boy. They don't like it to happen. Well, doomed. Doomed, I am doomed. Yes, we love Dad's Army. The thing that we loved about it was it was just always, always funny. <laughs> It's the character, it's the writing. Those are the things that have given it its longevity. In fact, we've always loved it. Still shown every day on the telly somewhere. Even my daughter, who's 13, finds it hilarious. Yes, Dad's Army's often raucous comedy simply transcends age. <laughs> Over the next 90 minutes, we'll discover the surprisingly low-key starting point. <laughs> Nobody was laughing. Reveal what the cast were really like when the cameras stopped rolling. Arthur the person was as patriotic as mannering the character. Please remind Mr Lowe. <laughs> Reminisce about the times before health and safety. You wonder whether they'd sit down and go, what can we get Clive to do this week? <laughs> what absurd thing can we persuade him to do? And he'll say yes, won't he? Enjoy some rare behind-the-scenes archive. Oh, happy birthday, young man and hear the memories of the youngest member of the troupe in an exclusive audio interview. Schweinhund! <laughs> Those were my director's notes. You've got carte blanche, do what you want. <laughs> As we discover exactly why we love Dad's Army. This is, in many ways, the perfect situation for comedy to happen in. Still, after all these years, it's probably one of the best British sitcoms ever made. All right, sit down, everyone. Well, I love Dad's Army now because I'm nostalgic for that period when I was a kid growing up and watching that show, which was such a huge part of family life. And there was something, of course, amazingly funny in the series, but also something very charming about it. Godfrey, pick them up, pick them up! I'm afraid they won't go any higher. Written by the legendary combination of David Croft and Jimmy Perry, Dad's Army has been gracing our screens since 1968. Can't get enough of it. And I'm amazed that there are 80 episodes, and 80 episodes are just amazing. I think it's so popular because, A, it's clean, and, B, people love seeing men in authority making fools of themselves. I shouldn't go too far that way, Mr Mannering. There's a great big... <laughs> Led by the pompous Captain Mannering and his urbane number two, Sergeant Wilson, the platoon also featured Corporal Jones and Privates Walker, Godfrey, Fraser and Pike, who inspired perhaps the show's most famous moment. This is still one of the best lines in, in any sitcom ever. It's just a, an amazingly funny moment because it really highlights what's wrong in their leadership. Right, what you like, you're not going to win this war. Oh, yes, we are. Oh, no, you're not. Oh, yes, we are. <laughs> Whistle while you work. <laughs> Hitler is a twerk. He's half army, so's his army. Whistle while you... Your name will also go on the list. <laughs> what is it? Don't tell him, Pike. Pike. <laughs> so, yes, I am at the top of those steps. And the only way I can stop from laughing is to bite the inside of my cheek. We finish the scene, and I climb down, gesture to the makeup girl, and she comes over and says, Can I have a tissue, please? And spat out the blood from the inside of it. It was the only way I could not laugh on the shot. We didn't know it was going to be like that, but we just knew it was a great line. <laughs> it's funny every time. It tells you everything you need to know about that man, those people, that situation, all in, in, in three words. Four words. The real Home Guard, originally the Local Defence Volunteers, or LDV, began life in 1940, with an announcement by the Secretary of State for War, Anthony Eden. We want large numbers of men between the ages of 17 and 65. Actor, writer and theatre manager Jimmy Perry served in the Home Guard as a young man, and it was these experiences that later inspired what became Dad's Army. I wrote this script and I call it The Fighting Tigers. And then I was working for D David Croft and he said, what a great idea. Let's work on it together. <laughs> and the rest is history. Who do you think? 
Our love for the show starts at the very beginning with these iconic opening titles. I think that's probably the most watched historical representation of the start of the Second World War that anyone has ever seen. It's really, really amazing and a very, very powerful imagery. At its peak, 18 million people were singing along to Jimmy Perry's catchy theme tune. But Dad's army did not take off straight away. The very first episode, um, I remember Bill Pertwee did the warm-up and he was brilliant. The audience were falling about laughing. He was a superb warm-up artist. And I uh, thought, oh, lovely, you know, lovely, live, lively audience, marvellous. And we got cracking and there was dead silence. There's certainly an uncomfortably echoey feel to this early exchange. Yes, Miss King. It's Anthony Eaton, sir. In person. <laughs> it's very important. And when I wasn't in a scene, sort of peering behind the flats, nobody was laughing. N no, <laughs> nobody was laughing. Um, and it was such a disappointment. And we thought we'd flopped. And everyone was very subdued going up to the bar afterwards. Un underwhelming. I think we felt underwhelmed. The less than spectacular response appeared to confirm concerns about the subject matter. What did the higher ups think of the series when you first broached it, or indeed when you had the first series? It, uh, it didn't sort of take off straight away, and uh, there was the thought that perhaps we were taking the Mickey out of England's finest hour. Uh, so they weren't all that keen. This it's the same hour. when you started, wasn't it? No. Yeah, quite. Yeah, quite. <laughs> you see, a lot of people took the Home Guard very, very seriously. Well, it was a serious thing. It seemed a silly idea, really, because I was in the Home Guard and nothing was so inexpressibly boring as being in the Home Guard. And I couldn't see how you could entertain people. In the 60s, the late 60s, when they made Dad's Army, it wasn't a far distant event. It had just happened. The effects were still very much present in British society. You had bits of London that were still bombed out. So to go back and have a laugh about it, that's edgy. Yet Dad's Army never hid from the genuine difficulties the Home Guard faced. From the start, authenticity was key. I researched very fully and made sure that um, everything that was on the screen, as far as I had uh, been concerned in it, was the real thing. Poor old Home Guard, when they first started out, had no weapons at all. So, um, you know, they would have uh, spears on the end of broomsticks. It was historically very accurate, um, particularly those early episodes when they haven't got uniforms and they haven't got weapons and you're in suits, bowler hats and a broomstick, you know, for a weapon. Um, very sweet. That's supposed to be, boy. <laughs> well, you said if you had nothing else, we'd tie a carving knife to a broom handle. I didn't say keep the brush on the end of it, you stupid boy. Well, he should have stayed. I don't want any insubordination. Take this man's name, Sergeant. Now, what's your name, lad? Well, you should know by now. You've been a friend of my mum since before I was born. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when it started, my father was in the Home Guard and he loved it because it was all so real. He had a, a broom with a knife tied to it, too, as a weapon. Uh, I remember my dad absolutely loving it because it brought back so many memories for him and him and my mum. I've seen photographs of them with sharpened sticks and, and like, hoes and <laughs> garden forts. Make do and mend, you know? Croft and Perry love to imagine their accident-prone platoon learning the same field skills as the real home guard. Countryside camouflage was a particular favourite. I did it in basic training and I do remember it because we used to literally get the trees and like the branches and stick them in all bits of us. And this genuine river crossing exercise is not quite emulated by the troop, as Clive Dunn expertly builds tension towards the gloriously inevitable payoff. Don't look down. <laughs> Don't look down. <laughs> The simple idea of Dad's army of laughing at the LDV. Don't you like to look at my feet? <laughs> that's what's interesting because it's it's funny because it's true. After the break, we look at the internal squabbles of the officer class. <laughs> that wonderful war between the petty bourgeois man and the man who has really got some style and class. And we get the lowdown on Mannering's struggles with the scripts. He did become quite well known for for not knowing his lines. One day he came in and he didn't know the words terribly well, did he? In one episode. And David said... Only uh, one episode. <laughs> <laughs> 
Welcome back to We Love Dad's Army. Look me straight in the eyes, Wilson. Look out! Perhaps the key to why we love Dad's Army is how much we enjoy watching the deliciously fractious partnership between the two officers charged with leading this ragtag platoon. I mean, the relationship between Mannering and Wilson is fascinating, and, and it's kind of like a marriage. Well, I think it's time I took charge here. Yeah. Because you've got Mannering, who needs everyone to see him as being the person in charge, but of course, ultimately, is the one who needs all the help. And Wilson is this kind of casual, relaxed character, which he would have to be to put up with this blustering nincompoop. Wilson is rather louche and public school, and Mannering is very much not. The thing is that Wilson couldn't care less about it. I think in one episode he says to him, I think you've got a chip on your shoulder. I should have known not to trust that smarmy Captain Stewart. Well, you can't blame him, sir. I mean, he's, he's got a job to do. Oh, you'll stick up for him, won't you? Both went to public schools, didn't you? No, I... <laughs> can't help feeling, sir. You've got a little bit of a chip on your shoulder about that. There's no chip on my shoulder, Wilson. I'll tell you what there is on my shoulder, though. Three pips, and don't you forget it. The whole contrast between... The, the, the whole class system, if you like, is, is laid bare there. It's that wonderful class war between them, between the petty bourgeois man and the man who has really got some style and class to him. I think that's what has given it its longevity, because I think that's as relevant today as it was then. Where have you been? Well, I went up to the golf club and had a bite to eat up there. The golf club? Yes. <laughs> who took you? Well, I'm a member. You're a member since when? Yes, but well, you see... When the uh, committee heard about this title thing, they asked me if I would, uh, you know, like to join. <laughs> I've been trying for years to get in there. <laughs> I believe they're awfully particular. <laughs> the brilliant thing about the relationship between Wilson and Mannering is Mannering's the captain, Wilson's the sergeant, and it should be the other way round. In all the military history you ever read, it's the sergeants who know what's going on and the captains who give the orders. And Croft and Perry knew that and they're using the comedy to illustrate that idea. Most of the junior ranks would listen to the sergeant, definitely. So you can see, you know, kind of interaction there between Wilson and Mannering because, you know, whereas Mannering's the captain and should be kind of the one that's leading everything, it's always going to be the sergeant that takes over. Do you really think that's wise, sir? John Le Measure as Wilson, I mean, it just says it all. He's not really asking the question, he's telling him that's not wise. I shall go through first. Yep. I'll ask you my men to do anything that I can't do. Do you think that's wise, sir? Wilson. <laughs> just get the rest of the platoon ready to come through. All right, so yeah. He never actually calls him a fool, he just asks him if he's a fool over and over again. It's brilliant. They may have been at loggerheads on screen, but off screen, despite press rumours at the time, the reality was quite different. John Lemez and Arthur got on terribly well with each other, and they were good friends. And even on screen, underneath the bickering, sometimes we would catch glimpses of mutual respect, even friendship between them. I mean, although Wilson does snipe rather cleverly at uh, Mannering, there are wonderful scenes of camaraderie between them, particularly the the scene when they're they're trapped in the, the bank with the bomb. I don't think I can stand very much more of this. <laughs> oh, come on, Wilson. Cheer up. It's a lovely warmth between them and just such a wonderful pair of character actors working together. I'm reminded of the tale of the Australian soldier. He arrived up at the front and was met by a British officer who said, Ah, my man, you come to die? And he said, No, sir. I came yes to die. on the pronunciation of the word die. Yeah. <laughs> you get it? <laughs> yes, I, I, I do get it, yes. <laughs> the two of them were like old-fashioned film star double acts. They were like Laurel and Hardy. I mean, they were incredible. But that partnership almost didn't happen. Arthur Lowe had made his name on ITV as Leonard Swindley in Coronation Street. I haven't made the tea yet. Thought perhaps we ought to wait until Mr. Fairclough arrives. Yes, let's hope he'll forgive the absence of anything stronger. <laughs> and Jimmy Perry had trouble convincing BBC head of comedy Michael Mills that Lowe should be their mannering. 
When I suggested Arthur Lowe, he said, Arthur Lowe, this is the BBC 30 years ago, we don't know him, do we? I mean, he doesn't work for us, does he? Isn't he up north with that Grenada thing in a back street somewhere? Yes. <laughs> I think from the first script I, I read of Dad's Arm, it was obvious that it was going to be good. And that one could make something from the character without trying very hard, really, because it was, it was there, it was, it was self-explanatory. I think to a certain extent he, he became the character. Uh, he really did. I mean, you could see Mannering in him even at home sometimes. Yeah. It said that Mannering felt that whoever held Warmington on sea held England. And uh, that, 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 would be, uh, that would be Arthur to a T. Are you anything like the character you play in Dad's Army, Captain Mannering? Oh, no, 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 no. No, certainly not. <laughs> I'm always being asked this question, and, uh, and the answer's definitely no. <laughs> Captain Mannering's a very pompous man, you know. Nothing pompous about me. <laughs> <laughs> That's very interesting, Arthur. Please, you mind, Mr. Lowe. <laughs> Arthur Lowe is one of the most underrated actors, I think, in the history of British television. Oh, Mr. Plinge! Where? You! Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. If you analyse how he played Mannering, it is sheer perfection. I mean, he said so much with his face, just gestures with his face, just an expression, just fleeting things. <laughs> I'll have a double scotch, please. He lived and he breathed Mannering, and even if he doesn't speak, you just couldn't imagine anyone else doing it. Perfect casting. And there are wonderful scenes, like the scene with the wig, trying to get the wig on because he's worried about, you know, being too old. <laughs> if you don't act those scenes well, they're just silly and slapstick, and to get away with that is brilliant. <laughs> At the end of the day, there's something wonderful about dead hair sat on top of a bald head. It's, but it's great, it's great, because Arthur Lowe is a master of playing it straight, you know, absolute god at playing it completely straight. What do you think of this? <laughs> well, it's awful. <laughs> no, 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 it's awfully good, awfully good. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> 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 What's up, Wilson? You might snap your girdle. That whole scene, you never see him crack at all. He wrote books and lyrics, as well as production numbers with Cyril Ornador. <laughs> I wish I'd read this before I came. <laughs> Too bad Arthur, he did a great deal of other work as well. And uh, he would really focus on Dad's Army on the day that Dad's Army was in the studio. And uh, he did become quite well known for, for not knowing his lines. One day he came in and he didn't know the words terribly well, did he? One episode. And David said... Only uh, one episode. <laughs> <laughs> uh, David Cross said, now take the script home and learn it. Don't put it in the desk, take it home and learn it. He said, certainly not. I'm not having any rubbish like that in my house. <laughs> uh, and uh, that was what it was like. Uh, he came home and he was at home. I mean, I have ridden in taxis with Arthur where I've been asked not to speak because he's been reading the script, possibly for the first time in the taxi. <laughs> he was actually a very quick study. I mean, the reason he didn't know his lines was would be because he hadn't looked at them. <laughs> now to an actor without whom no history of the post-war British cinema would be complete. It would be quicker, in fact, to list the films he hasn't been in than to list the ones he has. Ladies and gentlemen, John Le Mesure. Like Arthur Lowe, John Le Mesure was a familiar face to British audiences before Dad's Army. Appearing in dozens of films and acting with comic legends such as Peter Sellers and Tony Hancock. And just as Lowe resembled Mannering, Le Mesure mirrored Sergeant Wilson. In fact, he should have won an Oscar for being vague. But he made a, a, quite a good 
uh, life for himself by having other people look after him. I mean, uh, he didn't even like driving once uh, he got so fed up with it, he just left his car underneath one to a flyover and walked away. <laughs> I was fascinated watching them work. Um, John Le Maitre was so casual, uh, very laid back. He was always first at the rehearsal room, sitting quiet in the corner. Well, the thing about Wilson is because he's so sort of, you know, laissez-faire and louche and, you know, oh, really doesn't matter, sort of rather languid about things. He could be fantastically irritating because of that, but he's not. We really like him just because he's a real character. Wilson's laid back nature perhaps reached its zenith when he refused to be caught up in a spot of role play with Fulton Mackay's Captain Ramsay. Right, right, right! <whistles> now, I'm Gestapo officer. Now you, Sergeant. Mm, yes? What are you doing in France? Why well, not in France? Oh, yes, you are. <laughs> I've got my parachute. I've captured you and now I'm interrogating you. Oh, I see. Well, bonjour. <laughs> You're not supposed to tell me anything. Now, what are you doing in France? I don't know. You were trying to blow up a munitions factory. All right, I was trying to blow up a munitions factory. So, you admit it? Oh, really, this is too absurd. <laughs> right. I'll show you how absurd it is. I'm putting matches underneath your fingernails. I'm setting light to them. Burning down. Now they've reached your fingers. You're in agony. How do you like that? <laughs> Well, to be absolutely honest, it isn't really bothering me very much. <laughs> he was born to play Sergeant Wilson. I mean, at all times, reading 9.8 on the meter. So how do you occupy yourself when you're not actually acting? I don't know. I just sit about and play music and stare out of the window from time to time. And, uh, and people say to me constantly, what's the matter, John? You're upset or worried or anything. And I often find myself saying, well, no, I'm not at all, you know, I'm all right, you know, OK, but I'm not one of the, you know, people have, you can't have the way your face is built, can you? <laughs> really. He was such a lovely man. I felt so sorry for him. He was, um, uh, we'd had such unhappy marriages, hadn't he? I knew of him through my landlady, Peggy Ann, who was a great friend of Hattie Jake's, one of his wives. Well, now, another very important event in your life, Hattie, in that same year, on November the 10th, 1950, to be precise, you married well-known actor John La Measure. I worked with his wife, Hattie Jakes, and at the time I had no idea of the menage a trois which was going on in their home. And the fact that poor John had to live in the attic upstairs whilst uh, Hattie was frolicking downstairs with a much younger man. By the time Dad's army started, John had married third wife, Joan. But that relationship, too, was rocked when she had an affair with John's best friend, Tony Hancock. He was strong, in a way, as well. He was, he was you know, he was under, very understanding of what was going on. But thank God he was working, too, you know, at the time. He just had an air of tragedy about him. Um, and everybody had rushed around looking after him makeup girls powdering him down and he'd call everyone dear lady oh thank you dear lady thank you he was a charming man i mean to, especially to the ladies like a casanova <laughs> he was just a gentleman kind of suave sophisticated and just the way he walks he walked so slowly and so elegantly in the episode where he was dressed as a horse and <laughs> and yet he was the most elegant horse in the world. Wilson. Yes, sir? Office. Uh. <laughs> you want me to walk or gallop? <laughs> just in the office, will you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> oh, I loved him. I just love... I wish I could have met him. I wish I could have married him. Anyway, that's another story. <laughs> Coming up... What do you want? We look at the rest of the Magnificent Seven. They're just perfectly crafted. The relationships are so well drawn. Godfrey, come along, come on. And find out the surprising truth behind a private Godfrey catchphrase. David and Jimmy were very good, and that's why they kept writing all these parts, you know, can I be excused, so that he would have time to rest and, and go to the loo. <laughs> Welcome back to We Love Dad's Army. 
One outstanding element of this treasured sitcom was the tremendous ensemble cast. All, all of the characters, I think, are, are wonderfully done. Even though some of them are slightly broader and more pantomime than the others, still there's something really sweet and human about the way they all interact. And they became sort of national icons. Magnificent Seven, Croft used to call them, and they were. This seldom seen archive from the cine camera of Frank Williams, who played Dad's Army vicar Timothy Farthing, catches the ensemble in unguarded moments. That's right, open the champagne. And of course, you're overacting, aren't you? You're overacting, Bill. The whole cast had decades of experience behind them, except one. Ian, of course, he's doing the Times crossword, as he does. Yes, Ian. I liked Pike just because he was sort of a younger character, a little bit cheeky. Oh, you stupid boy. <laughs> and when a 22-year-old Ian Lavender landed the part, his agent Anne had a small confession to make. She took me out for lunch. She said, I've got something to tell you. So she said, David Croft. Yes. And here's my husband. She said, you got the interview because I'm married to him. You got the job because he wants you. Oh, yeah, fine, she said. All right, then, don't believe me. She said, but believe this, he can always write you out. <laughs> so I can honestly say my agent was sleeping with the director. Ian was lovely. I got on very well with Ian. We were the youngest. I used to pick him up on the way to rehearsals at Hammersmith Broadway, a little second-hand mini. You couldn't park there now, could you? I used to pull in, wait for him, coming out of the tube. <laughs> Gosh. He was of the age, Pike, although I sort of vaguely fancied him, but he was such a sort of hilarious mummy's boy with so many sort of ailments and things that you couldn't quite... It was really hilarious. Pike, you must not wear a coloured scarf with your uniform. How many times do I have to tell you? Take that off at once. Oh, my mum says I mustn't take it off, I get croup. <laughs> croup? Chickens get that, don't they? Yes, that's right. Yes. <laughs> he is also... There, I think, to entertain the idea that some people do think war's a great big adventure. He sees the war through the prism of films and baddies and good guys, and for him, the guns are a prop. Uh, I think that's such a key element to the sweetness of Dad's army. And Ian was a very, very bright fellow, uh, so he could turn his part to any sort of character acting that there was. The, the fantastic scene with him and John Lemesrier, Wilson, uh, when they were dressed as, uh, as Germans, German officers, uh, it was absolutely genius. <laughs> the instructions from my director when I went, what do you want me to do with this, David? And he just looked at me and said, do anything you want. You've got carte blanche. Try <laughs> hunt! <laughs> Now, eh? <laughs> you have just five seconds to tell us your plans, or else it is kaput. <laughs> I like being an officer, don't you, Uncle Arthur? <laughs> Pike's Uncle Arthur was in a semi clandestine relationship with Pike's mum, Mavis, leaving some to wonder if he was more than just an uncle. Uncle Arthur, he's Uncle Arthur. But is he Pike's Uncle Arthur? Is he Pike's father? Or what is the relationship between uh, Uncle Arthur and Mrs. Pike? I bet you're a proud father. I don't quite follow you. Well, you're a son becoming an officer. And I think there's one episode where it's alluded to the fact that Wilson and Pike could be father and son. He's not my son, see. Because they were touching their face at exactly the same time. And there, there were exactly the same mannerisms that were going on. And, you, and it made you think, Oh, I wonder. What size does the young man what take? What size? What, uh, what size? Hmm? Uh, what? Nine. Nine. Please. Nine. Please. Please. But my character thought he was my uncle, so that's all I needed to know. And uh, we'd finished the last recording ever. And as we were leaving the studio, I said to David, uh, David, I've got to ask you one thing. Is Sergeant Wilson my father? And he just looked at me and said, of course he is. And that was it. Mr. Lorry, please. Mr. Lorry. What do you want? Private Fraser, the doubting Thomas of the troupe, was played by John Lorry, a highly respected actor of stage and screen. Doomed, I am. Doomed to be surrounded by idiots. Bugger off. 
Fraser's brilliant because I, I remember seeing him in the 39 Steps. He's got that kind of, you know, he's got a great, he's, he's, he's a master of the grimace and the... Go in with the gentleman. He'll stay with us till tomorrow morning. Your daughter? My wife. Clearly a proper actor, you know. Not like one of those comedy actors, proper one. Oh, long before I was 30, I was playing Hamlet at Stratford and Avon. Also, uh, Othello, King Lear, Richard III. I, I played all the parts in Shakespeare that anybody could want to play. Croft and Perry obviously thought they needed people who could do super serious and that that would be funny, and that's what they're doing with Fraser. I mean, it's so funny, it's brilliant. What's on this? Uh, <laughs> I'm coming and talk to you for a minute. <laughs> I'm sorry about the candles. The blinds are a bit thin for the glare of the gaslight. I, I like candles. They're, they're, they're more romantic. <laughs> I think John Laurie was very much like Fraser, and I think he could have his moments where he could be uh, maybe a little difficult. I mean, it was just a lousy part. I realised that, but I was out of work, and, and the actors will take anything. I'm here, look. And, uh... <laughs> And Jimmy would write that into the scene and have Fraser shouting the odds and then going into these long monologues, which, of course, used his natural theatrical talent. The great thing, as soon as Fraser speaks, everybody falls silent because he's, he, he can hold the room. He's good. He's a great performer like that. Captain Margaret, eh? <laughs> did, did he ever hear the story uh, of the old empty barn? <laughs> No. Would he like to hear the story of the old empty barn? Oh, yes. They're drawn in. What's he going to say? Where's this story going to lead us? Is he going to frighten the life out of all of us? He commands us. He hypnotizes us. Story of the old empty barn. <laughs> well. There was nothing in it. <laughs> there was nothing in it. There was nothing in it. Next to Fraser was Private Walker, a role Jimmy Perry originally wrote for himself, but that was eventually taken by James Beck. I always loved Walker. Walker was just such a lovely character. I think I partly loved him as well because I was a big Roxy music fan and Brian Ferry went through a phase of having slick back hair and a moustache. And I don't know, maybe Brian Ferry was a big Dad's Army fan. Maybe that was his tribute to Walker. I'm in with the in crowd. I go with the in crowd. James Beck pulls off a remarkable um, performance, I think, with Walker because such an iconic wartime character, that way he dresses the, the sort of zoot suit and the, 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 the jaunty cap and the cigarette and the little, the little spiv moustache, ducking and diving, bribing people, helping the platoon out. So he's taking a lot of cultural images that everybody still remembered in the 60s. Hey, James. Oh, I made it. Ah, made it. I've got 10 minutes before the parade begins, so I've got a few essential items here that are in short supply in the stocks. Come over here. No, no, I've got some uh, hair grip, some chocolate biscuits there. Oh, and some elastic. <gasps> What about that? How much? Five bob a yard. Five bob a yard? <laughs> Not bad, is it? You can't get it anywhere. It's so long since it's been in the shop, some of you ladies must have been getting a bit desperate. You couldn't help but like Walker because he always came up trumps. He always came up with some great ideas on what to do. And this is the interesting thing about Dad's Army, is that Private Walker's in there saying, come on, let's be honest now, there was a black market. It's all part of actually kind of how, uh, if you want, edgy or honest. The programme's being honest. And, you know, and there's comedy in honesty. Mannering would be sort of very sneery as to what he was doing, but was not adverse to taking the ill-gotten black market goods. I just want you to have a word with Captain Mannering. All right. Psst, oi. Hmm? I've got your cheese. Good one. I've got your cheese. Come here, sir. Yes. It isn't for me, of course. No, no, of course not, no. You know, I don't approve of that sort of thing. No, no, in that case, I'll take it no, back. No, 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 no. <laughs> Almost the polar opposite of Streetwise Walker... Hit it. Come, go for it. Come along. Come on, quickly, quickly as you can. For heaven's sake. Quickly. quickly. ...was the oldest member of the platoon, Private Godfrey, played by Arnold Ridley. 
Could you halt right there, please? Halt. Arnold Ridley, actor and playwright. Tonight, this is your life. <laughs> and smile, please. <laughs> I kind of like Godfrey because it was just sort of differing, this kind of thing. You know, this white, how are you in the army? You know, it's that kind of thing. You know, how are you going to protect us? I really used to look forward to seeing Godfrey pipe up, which was maybe only two or three times an episode, but it, it was such a reassuring presence and it was always so funny and always so sweet. And Marion was quite tough on him, really, because he was such a gentle son, of like, Godfrey, sort that out. You know, he was all for... I always sort of felt really sorry for him. Godfrey, where's Godfrey? <laughs> Godfrey! Did someone call? <laughs> I'm terribly sorry, sir. I, I, I must have dozed off. Dozed off? <laughs> We're guarding a dangerous bunch of cutthroats, and you doze off. I want you to watch them like a hawk, you understand? Like a hawk! When casting, David Croft's one concern was whether 72-year-old Ridley, a distinguished veteran of both world wars, could manage the rigours of a regular filming schedule. He said, I'm only worried about it is. I don't know whether you'll be able to stand up to it. It's not very serious. And I said, well, I think I'm as fit as anything for 72. And he said, well, I'll let you know in two days' time. And I didn't realise that I, uh, what, what really was at stake. I was going, didn't realise I'd got eight years' work ahead of me. <laughs> I thought it was about eight weeks at the most. <laughs> he just loved being there, Arnold, um, being part of it. And David and Jimmy were very good. that They didn't give him anything that was too strenuous. Um, and that's why they kept writing all these parts of, um, you know, can I be excused, so that he would have time to rest and, and go to the loo. <laughs> what is it, Godfrey? Do you think I might be excused? <laughs> Sorry, it's been an awful long time in that boat, sir. You should have taken advantage of it, shouldn't you? <laughs> Arnold was very kind, very gentle, but strong, much, much stronger than the part he played. I mean, he and Clive Dunn used to tell the filthiest jokes, and I was only 22, and I was sort of shocked with this lovely, sweet old boy, you know. And out would come, <laughs> come on, these <laughs> very naughty jokes. Da, 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 da. I stand right behind Arnold, and he goes, da, 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 da. <laughs> And I know exactly what he's thinking. It's ten past ten and the pubs are still <laughs> After the break, the incomparable Clive Dunn. Clive Dunn really put his neck on the line for the show. And a story from the days before health and safety kicked in. There was this panic going on as they realised that actually Dad, for some reason, was still out, quite a way out in a boat on his own. Welcome back to We Love Dad's Army. <laughs> what are you blowing that for? They don't work if you suck them. Oh. <laughs> Clive Dunn as Jones, of course, the most iconic character, I think, in the show. Certainly the one that everybody had an impression of at school. But he seemed to be almost as if he was the oldest, yet he wasn't because he was, at the time, Clive Dunn, the actor, was under 50 years of age. I've been sitting here all day. Thinking. In 1971, Clive Dunn topped the charts with Grandad. Aged just 51 at the time, he'd already been charming viewers with his convincing portrayal of a slightly decrepit old man for three years. He seemed to have carved a career playing these old men. He'd done it before. Because in real life, he was a very suave, elegant, uh, with a suede jacket and beautiful shirts and trousers. When I first joined, he had to have a lot of makeup to look him look like, you know, Jones. But as the time went by, <laughs> makeup used to laugh and they say, oh, we need less and less makeup with him because, um, you know, he's growing into the part. And that again was brilliant casting because it meant as an old man he could do all those wonderful, wonderful stunts. He could actually be the climb off the group. And boy, Croft and Perry used that to great effect. Take it easy, Jones. Yeah, all right, sir. I'm nearly, I'm nearly there, sir. I'm nearly over. I'm nearly there, sir. Yes, all right, sir. I'm nearly there, sir. Go on! <laughs> Clive Dunn really put his neck on the line for the show. You, you wonder whether they'd sit down and go, what can we get Clive to do this week? 
<laughs> what absurd thing can we persuade him to do? And he'll say yes, won't he? I'll be the one who wants to be shot, Mr. Man. You know, he'll do all of that, he'll do anything. There was no situation Jonesy couldn't turn into a moment of laugh-out-loud slapstick comedy. Mr. Manrin! Mr. Manrin! It's where the comedy is at its broadest, really, and that's perhaps why, as a kid, I loved it. And that's, once again, a masterstroke, the reason why it was so popular with all ages. Initially, though, Dunn wasn't sure about taking the role, and it almost went to a young David Jason. Did you say yes to that part immediately? Oh, no, I didn't say yes. Yeah. <laughs> now, to be honest, I didn't, I didn't, I'd just been in a show that I wasn't very good in, and I thought, I don't want to go in another show I'm not very good in. <laughs> Jimmy Perry based Jones on a character from his days in the Home Guard and gave him the privileged position of the town's butcher. The thing I like about the relationship between Jones and Mannering is, um, you know, he's completely at his beck and call, um, a military man through and through. But then every now and then, there's a little threat of Mannering not getting his ration of meat that week when when, when Corporal Jones isn't getting what he wanted. Oh, sir, yeah. there's, um, <laughs> there's a couple of pounds of steak there, sir. Compliment to the house. Oh. Yes, sir. Oh, by the way, sir, uh, what about my stripe? Your stripe? <laughs> <laughs> I was in Lance Corporal for 14 years. Can I keep it? No, Jones, I'm afraid you can't. Well, in that case, I'll keep the steak, I think. <laughs> I love that about him. I love that steely quality about him being prepared to use his valued position as butcher in the village to get what he wants. Jones's butcher's van became a vital tool for the platoon throughout the series. Here is my van. Here we are. I'm afraid we don't have a Jonesy in it. This rare footage sees the cast taking the van for a spin on the London to Brighton Veteran Car Rally. Well, I think Clive was quite nervous about driving it. It wasn't the easiest vehicle in the world, being so old, uh, with a very strange steering wheel. So it took him a while, but he got used to it. You must be very proud of Corporal Jones, though. What a superb job at the wheel. A marvellous job, a marvellous job indeed. I, I think it was it was excellent. <laughs> and how did she behave? Oh, she behaved very well, sir. It brought, got rather a lot of steam come out, sir. Yeah, yeah, I know. I we think, formed our yeah. own smoke screen so yeah, that nobody you... could see us as we come through. <laughs> but the legendary van hadn't always been in such great shape. The prop buyer and myself looked around for quite some time until we found a garage that had something suitable. Um, it was in a terrible state. We had it uh, renovated and made roadworthy. Then I designed the graphics for the side of the vehicle in a way that was the same sort of style that you expected of, of Jonesy himself. The van was often at the heart of Dad's Army's signature set-piece capers that Jimmy Perry had encouraged from the very start. He said it was adventure comedy, and he said that was the only way they could really get the laughs, because, I mean, look at it, they were ridiculous ideas, weren't they? Do it! <laughs> Croft and Perry were unrestrained by any sense of trying to either keep it characterful, real, or broad comedy. They had all of these things at their disposal and they weren't afraid to use any of them. And Mannering being dragged around the countryside strapped to a barrage balloon. I mean, it's just, they, they really give their value for money. I mean, yes, it, it was totally and completely um, adventure comedy. Well, Clive, Bill and I are often the subjects of this adventure comedy in that you know, if somebody had to fall into a river or whatever, it would be one of us three, uh, to the extent that uh, wardrobe just automatically packed wetsuits for us. Uh, but it was always us, because we were young. But perhaps the show's most complex water scene was bravely shot in studio and required some breathtaking ingenuity from the Dad's Army crew. What am I going to do when the water reaches my head? Oh, don't worry about that. We'd have thought of something by then. <laughs> we had two sequences where the water was low down and then later on it was higher up. And we did that by lowering the set into the water, which was done behind closed screens in front of the audience. Yeah. If you don't let me up on that bunk, I'll tell Mum. 
the set itself got an applause from the audience and that I don't think it's ever happened to me before or since, actually. <laughs> give us a hand. Come, Come on, give us a pull. different now, isn't it? But well, I wanted to get in your bar. Oh. You didn't want to know. No, no, no. 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 Also meant that Bill Pertwee and I, instead of standing in the water, now had to kneel so that the water was at our shoulders. Well, that's when you suddenly realise your bodies are quite buoyant, and somebody had to be in there holding holding Pertwee down in his, in his water tank so he didn't fall, fall over. I think one of the reasons people love Dad's Army is you get the feeling that. There's nothing Croft and Perry wouldn't do to one of their characters if it got them a laugh. Oh, it's someone's birthday. As Frank Williams's home movie shows, the popular Bill Pertwee was nothing like his warden character. Well, happy birthday, young man. But he was often the one asked to be the full guy in the name of comedy. David and Jimmy said that um, the great thing was about Bill, we could throw anything at him. He didn't mind a bit. We throw barrels of horrible old manure all over him or water and chuck him in this, this lake here. I, I remember Dad was forever in the water. Oh, here we go again! He used to come back after doing the rehearsals and then say, isn't it all marvellous, aren't we all lucky? It was fine with him, he didn't mind. There was no health and safety then. That lack of health and safety wasn't usually an issue, until one night when life began imitating art for the unfortunate Pertwee. They'd gone out to do a scene in the sea off the pier, and it was a night shoot, pretty late. And Dad is in a boat on his own. I wonder what it is, can I make him a lot of splashing? Hey! Put that down! And the two guys who were filming thought Dad had been taken back in another boat. So everyone came back to the Thetford Hotel and there was this sort of slight panic going on as they realised that actually Dad, for some reason, was still out, quite a way out in a boat on his own, paddling back to the pier. But that was a bit hairy, he told me. Um, and we were a little bit worried. I could, I could sense the um, atmosphere, but all ended OK. Captain Mannering and the platoon would no doubt have had little sympathy for Hodges being cast adrift in the North Sea, but he was a vital part of the show. They obviously needed in the series, they needed an antagonist because we do never see the Germans. So as the ARP warden, he's there for them to bump up against. He was the perfect foil for, for Mannering in, in Dad's army. And Hodges could call on some heavenly backup. It's supposed to be Hitler, but it's actually the ARP warden of the Vicar and the Virgin he's really fighting against most of the time. They represent the dark side, but they're just Jobsworths, aren't they? That's it, they're just annoying, idiotic Jobsworths. And we love to see these Jobsworths get their comeuppance. <laughs> there were some iconic moments, or seconds, if you like, and there's the one with the grenades going off and it's just perfectly timed and you see Walker with his cigarette throw it into the box of dynamite. And there's this lovely pause. And then Dad just comes up, reveals himself with this angst look on his face. <laughs> All sorts going on, as Clive would probably say to him, Bill overacting again. Still to come, the mysterious Mrs. Mannering. Fear, terror, anger, <laughs> just so many emotions. And we get a rare peek behind the scenes of Dad's Army on location. You know, they'd be up all night, they wouldn't get to bed. They'd still be well perfect the next day, God knows how. Welcome back to We Love Dad's Army. You are something about Dad's Army. I don't think they're ever going to say uh, one of the female characters because they were essentially non existent. This is a man's world! The cast of Dad's Army was overwhelmingly male. This is a man's world! Nevertheless, women weren't completely absent. Wendy Richard had a recurring role as Walker's girlfriend. Jonesy constantly lusted after Pamela Cundell's wonderfully brassy Mrs. Fox while Barbara Windsor once appeared as a theatrical crack shot in a typically risque role that chimed with her carry-on persona. How's that? Transformation. Right. Right. <laughs> Shut! Stick your chest out! Cool. 
Producer and writer David Croft certainly saw it as a very male comedy from the start. When I arrived for the interview, he told me straight out he didn't want me. He didn't want a girl in it. He wanted just men. He didn't want any women at all. Um, Michael Mills, who was then head of comedy, had insisted you can't have a comedy without a blonde. One regular female character, however, was Pike's mum, Mavis, played by Janet Davis. She's sort of blonde, she's managing to dye her hair through the war. She's the sort of the, the epitome of the sort of, of, of womanhood outside of this bunch of men. She's uh, clearly having an affair with Sergeant Wilson. He is on a knife edge all the time. He can't be obvious about their relationship, but he wants to keep it, so he can't be that rude to her, you know? I, I really think you're being rather silly. Oh, I'm silly, am I? Well, you're very silly if you think that I'm only here to administer to all your little comforts every evening. Oh, now, Mavis, please. You think sake. that you've only got to knock on my door and I shall come running? Now, I've never asked you to run, Mavis. <laughs> she plainly runs the relationship. It's, it's a wonderful thing to watch and, and uh, comically rich. At least we saw Mavis. Captain Mannering's domineering wife, Elizabeth, remained defiantly off-screen. And you always knew you were never going to see her, but it didn't matter because you felt you knew her. And you knew that all of the platoon knew her, and they all knew how terrified he was of her. I think many other uh, comedies have lifted the idea that you never see a character, but you only ever hear them talked about and the reaction to them. It's your wife, sir. What? Your wife. Tell her I'm not here. I'm sorry, <laughs> sir, but I, uh, she heard you shouting, you see. <laughs> really? <Yeah. laughs> Hello, Elizabeth? <laughs> Arthur Lowe's face when Elizabeth phones him to tell him off his fear, terror, anger, <laughs> just so many emotions. I might have a little surprise for you tonight. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm <laughs> One episode did have more of a gender balance, however. Mum's Army took its inspiration from women being recruited into the Home Guard. The mum's army sticks in my mind because of the drill. Like, you just get it wrong. I remember like sergeant shouting in my ear, Private Holmes, get off the price ground now. And I'd go, oh, I'm in trouble. Left turn. <laughs> yeah, there seems to be some confusion as to which is which. Yes, I know, I know. It's just, I could just imagine if all those women were out on a parade square, you know, they've all got their lipstick on and their hair all over and, you know, kind of all dressed normal and you're like, no. Nah. <laughs> Croft and Perry use this tale of female recruitment to show a different side to Mannering as they delivered a heartbreaking love story. This is the beauty of the writing whereby Mannering falls in love. And he's putty in the hands of this lady who he meets called Fiona, played by the actress Carmen Silvera. And he falls for her hook, line and sinker. I was very lucky to get uh, Carmen Silvera to play Mrs. Gray. I, of course, ultimately I used her in the lower low. Um, she's a lovely actress. And she was uh, so retiring and so delicate the way she played it. It was a beautiful performance. Captain Mannering. Hmm? May I ask you something awfully personal? Yes. Do you always wear glasses? <laughs> yes, yes, I always have. Would you take them off for a moment? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so much better. Do you know, I think spectacle. Well, they, they take away the warmth in a person's eyes, just as the fire guard takes away so much of the heat. <laughs> I think it's the first time you see his vulnerability and you see him fall in love. And so did she. But you knew it was doomed. While the family life of the platoon may have been largely absent from the screen, behind the cameras it was different, particularly when it came to the annual trips to film on location in Norfolk. Well, we all saw it as a family holiday. We'd all arrive at Television Centre and get on the buses, including Arthur, and Arthur always had to sit at the front because, of course, he was head of the team. We were like a family when we went away filming. No responsibility of, of telephones ringing at home and letters to answer, anything like that. We became a family up there for, for over nine years, and so it was great. I remember going up to Thetford on several times in the school holidays. They used to call it Croft Summers because it was just glorious sunshine the whole time. 
This intimate behind-the-scenes cine footage shows how the family of the cast were allowed to mingle in the relaxed atmosphere encouraged by Croft and Perry. David Croft was actually tremendous to work with. One take David, he loved, <laughs> he loved to do just one take if he possibly could and, uh, and go straight on. And then sound had come through and they'd say, um, David, we've got a mic and shot, we need to redo it. And he said, we're not redoing it because it was very funny. If people at home see the mic, they've missed the joke. Dad was very impressed with the way they were. You know, they weren't the type of creators that shouted and screamed at everyone. And that niceness, if you like, or pleasantness seemed to spread throughout that, the whole thing. They all got on so well. I mean, when they were shooting on, on location in Tetford, they were, they were like, you know, best of pals. To me, as a, a young actor, just starting out, I got these seven other people who came from seven totally different backgrounds, socially and professionally, to watch and to learn from. It was like going back to summer school every year. It was wonderful, and I got paid. I think one of the joys of Dad's Army was you felt that they all loved each other. And you felt that, that this incredible sense of camaraderie, both in the situation their characters were in, of fighting the war, but also as actors. It was good fun. The, the one episode that I particularly liked, it was where the harvester was used. And uh, I had a harmonium at home, that one, and actually it was that harmonium that I brought for the, the lady to play in the field. The sword of harvest home, all is safely gathered in ere the winter storms begin. At this point, the platoon is sloshed on potato wine, a state authentically captured by the entire cast as they begin drunkenly bickering amongst themselves. You talk to me like that, you you drunken old snob. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, Fraser, I can look after myself. <laughs> The day's work was serious, it was long, it was arduous, but when we got back and relaxed, there was two or three hours over supper, dinner and a drink in the bar were great fun. If there was a time when we bonded, then that's when we did truly bond. John Le Mesure and um, Jimmy Beck, you know, they'd be up all night, they wouldn't get to bed, they'd be drinking companions. And uh, they still be were perfect the next day, God knows how. In the final part of the show, we look at the longevity of Dad's Army. One of those rare things, the time was right, the cast was right, the script was right, and the idea was right. And discover the origin of Mannering's most uttered phrase. Dad never said, you stupid boy, to me. But I sort of heard the line in my own head, you stupid boy. And I, I think <laughs> we're pretty close. Welcome back. As We Love Dad's Army makes its final push, it's time to celebrate an element of the series that we all adore. Ah, Pelican Crossing. The light's green. Carry on, Jones. The catchphrases. Don't panic, don't panic! Captain Manning, in the light flashing, what do we do? Don't panic, don't panic. They don't like it at them. Excuse me. Stupid boy. You stupid boy. What are you? He's doomed! All you really want Fraser to do is say we're all doomed, everyone's happy. All of these catchphrases have just travelled for decades, and that is the sign of a piece of universal, timeless art, isn't it? Don't panic in particular, I think. It's just burned into us, into our sort of comic retina. The Germans are coming, don't panic! The Germans are coming! The Germans are coming! Don't panic! Don't panic! There's a mine under the pier! It is part of British society, as part of the fabric of life, as is that TV series. And always will be. Catchphrase they don't like it up from was when I was in the army, proper army, and was the Bennett. Here you are. You don't like it up from you know. You do not like it up from you. Who does? <laughs> that was probably the biggest catchphrase to come out of the show, I think. I mean, everyone loved it. And it kind of works in most situations, bizarrely. Um, that, was, that was, I think, a tribute not only to the writing, but also to Clive Dunn's performance. There's no substitute for the cold steel. 
They do not like it up em. They don't like it up em. <laughs> you actually believe that he did at some point stick one up em because he says it with such joy and glee. When three episodes lost from the BBC archives were remade in 2019, the huge popularity of the catchphrases was obvious. It was a problem for us in the last episodes because we got to a moment where Kevin Eldon had to say, and I'll give them a bit of the cold steel and they don't like it up and they don't like it up. And the audience went crazy. I'm the right man for the job, sir. I am the man with the fat potential. And what is more, I would let them have a taste of cold steel because they don't like it up and sir. They do not like it up and yes. You had to ask them, could they not quite respond to that particular line? Uh, so, so enthusiastically. When Dad's Army was rebooted as a movie in 2016, Bravo, Mandarin. the catchphrases were inevitably part of the trailer, reassuring fans that their favourite lines would not be overlooked. All hands on deck. An enemy spy is operating somewhere near here. I'll catch him, sir. What does he look like? We don't know, Frank. That's rather the point with spies. Stupid boy. Captain Mannering's withering put-down of poor Pike was probably the most uttered catchphrase of the show. When I was a boy, a terrible school report, and my father said to me, this is awful, you've got, no, you've got to have some qualifications. I said, I don't need any qualifications. I'm going to be a famous film star or a great comedian. And he looked at me and said, you stupid boy. I know that Jimmy and David never set out initially to write catchphrases. Catchphrases write themselves. If a catchphrase happens that the character uses, a line that they use a few times, and the public latch onto it, then you've got your catchphrase. That's the great thing about a really good actor. A catchphrase doesn't seem like a catchphrase because he always says it slightly differently in the context of the line. It's very often a throwaway at the end of what he's said. So he incorporates it into the sense of whatever the scene is. Is he fighting you, Mr. Mannering? <laughs> of course he's not fighting me, you stupid boy. <laughs> well, it's easily solved, isn't it? <laughs> stupid boy. <laughs> Stupid boy. <laughs> it wasn't repeating stupid boy. It was sometimes anger, sometimes humorous, uh, and that was what was brilliant, and he delivered it so well. If you were going to have a catchphrase, deliver it well. Arthur did. Dad never, ever said, you stupid boy, to me, but I often saw him looking at me, and, and I heard, I, I sort of heard the line in my own head, you stupid boy, and I, I think <laughs> we're pretty close. <laughs> But perhaps the one thing that makes Dad's army stand out amongst the crowd is its utter Britishness. The reason that Dad's army has endured for half a century through 80 episodes, Christmas specials, is because it is a beautifully played, beautifully written comedy that has heart. One of those rare things, the time was right, the cast was right, the script was right, and the idea was right. I think you absolutely could describe Dad's Army as the quintessential British sitcom. This is the sitcom which reflects aspects of our character and our personality that we would like to have. Even though we're a bit, a bit crap in some things, we will carry on and do our best. The reason it's endured is because it's darn funny. And nothing survives like stuff that's properly funny with characters who we can laugh at and feel affection for. We know people like those people in that cast that we can relate to. That's what comedy is. I think the British especially love the underdog. It's very endearing to see a little man triumph. It sums up nostalgia, it sums up the best of us, it sums up winning. It never fails to make me smile. It usually leaves me with a warm glow. And there's very little that makes me laugh out loud. And Dad's Army is just one of those programmes that does. Dad's Army made us laugh for 80 episodes. But the final scene made a serious point, as the platoon saluted the inspiration for the whole series. It ends 
on a wonderful moment when they all agree that they will stand and fight and they make a tribute to, to the home guard, to camera. And what an amazing end to nine years of Dad's army. Anybody who tries to take our homes or our freedom away from us, they'll find out what we can do. We'll fight. And we're not alone. There are thousands of us all over England. And Scotland. And Scotland. <laughs> all over Great Britain, in fact. Men who will stand together when their country needs them. Excuse me, sir, don't you think it might be a nice idea if we were to pay our tribute to them? For once, Wilson, I agree with you. <laughs> to Britain's home guard. The Britain's home, home guard. guard. Dad's view on it was that he just absolutely felt pretty privileged, I think, that he was in such a show and that it had given him such a happy time in his life. I think Johnny would be pleasantly surprised, really. You know, he wouldn't be jumping up and down. He would just go, I can't believe people are still watching it, you know. He loved it, yeah. They were brothers in arms by the end of um, shooting Dad's army, and uh, this, this showed in the way they were knitted as a team, yeah. The only reason why it stopped, because mm. we lost three, of our leading characters, and we were all getting rather old. So, you know, we stopped while the going was still good. Somehow we belonged to the country. It seemed as though we were part of the fabric, and people liked having us around like a favourite armchair, um, which was a very, very lovely feeling to have. Hey, it's, it's a living. Or it was. <laughs> yeah, I miss it terribly. It was, to me, the finest kind of pension an old man could have.